everybody. This is Joy Halstead, and I'm hosting Soapbox tonight. I'm, I have been on a little hiatus, but I'm back. And tonight our show is going to be about homeless youths in the River City. Um, finding this a really um, major issue with our homeless population, and I think the kids get the, get the worst of it. Um, but before we get into the show and make our in introductions, I want to thank our underwriters. Uh, the first one is Pieces Pizza by The Slice, including low vegan, I mean, sorry, <laughs> low fat, vegan, gluten free options, as well as a fine selection of beer, wine, and soft drinks. We thank them for supplying pizza for the crew. They're at 21st Street near Capitol Avenue in Sacramento. The phone number is 916. 441-1949. And our other underwriter is our own James Israel. Uh, he puts out the Humor Times. It bills itself as the world's funniest news source. This is a monthly political humor magazine and is available on um, worldwide subscription in print or digital format. Subscription info along with cartoons, funny fake news, video, and more info can be found at humortimes.com. Also, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we do have a Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash soapbox sack. And we also uh, will be putting our shows up on YouTube, so please check that out as well. Um, we are at Soapbox Sacramento. So we're going to go ahead and do our introductions now, and I'm really, really happy these people are here tonight. Um, it means a lot, and they're very knowledgeable, and they're really um, good for our community. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, my first guest is Kimberly Church. She's a professor of communications at Sac City College. Um, Victor Bra Brazelton is a community activist. And our homeless youth here is Eero Sterling. She is with Sacramento Youth Council. And uh, she's also a homeless uh, a youth in Sacramento and also a college student. And uh, we also have our little puppy, whose name's Ohana. It's being really good right now. So let's get into it here. Um, Eero, I'm really curious because I've never been homeless. Um, and, and I, I can't understand for a, a, a young person how hard it must be to have to be on the streets. And, you know, just how, how difficult is it every day for you? It's different for everybody. For some people, they've been homeless their own lives. I've met young people who have been homeless since the time they were kids, raised by other homeless kids. And there's people like me who were displaced because they didn't get along with their family. So it depends on what situation you're in. Um, and so uh, what kind of assistance have you sought out or found that there isn't any out there? I sought out assistance in like getting a job or like be being presentable at a job or like help with that. And I sought out for WIND and the LGBT Center and I found it that they were somewhat helpful on like making a resume but honestly Sacramento Works was the most helpful because they helped me do a resume and print as many resumes as I needed and cover letters and mine came out a lot better when I went to Sacramento Steps for Sac Sacramento Works. And it's really hard to find a job when you don't have a, a, a real address. Yeah. Um, I usually use like a friend's address or like my parents' address. Mm -hmm. Although we don't get along, I still have my mail sent there. Also, Wynn has an address, but I don't no longer use them and no longer client. Okay. And so, like a typical day for you, what, you know, from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep, what what do you do all day? Well, for the most part, it's like I get up really, really early. So like I see as few cops or as few policemen, sheriffs, security guards as possible and make it to where I need to go. So like a typical, like I get up and I go to my counseling appointment, which takes about two hours to walk to because I don't have bus fare. That's a lot of miles put in every day, correct? I mean, yeah. 
And especially like if the weather's, you know, it's either hot or cold, it must be really just yeah. a pain in the behind yeah. to get where you need to go just to get stuff to survive. I mean, yeah. I, I, can, I can relate because right now I'm without a car and I know how hard it is to get stuff, you know, just to eat. It's very difficult. Um, and so I wanted to ask Kimberly, since she has a more of an authority on some of the, um, well, she has got more information as far as stats and also, you know, the system itself. She's got a better background in it as far as, you know, how it's not working for people, especially kids. Um, and I was, I was curious as to how, like, just being a youth, how much harder it is for them to get access to, to stuff that could help them survive. You know, I, I was born and raised in Sacramento, and I was, I was only recently became aware of this problem. We sort of stumbled upon it haphazardly looking for a summer project to work with young people and found out that Wind had relocated to Oak Park. And my friend Victor and I were at a Malcolm X barbecue and ran into a former employee of Wind that said that it was right down the street. And um, so we, we, we went there and found that it wasn't as accessible as I had thought. And it also wasn't as accessible as they had claimed. And <clears throat> so I wouldn't say that I'm an authority on it, but it certainly was something that I couldn't put aside uh, because in part of the juxtaposition of spending about $250 million on an arena that is essentially subsidizing millionaires. Yeah, that's a sore and subject. And yet we have young people sleeping in dog runs at youth centers. And I think about a week late after we saw that, it came out in the B that California and was one of the largest economies in the world and so I just started to look at some of the numbers that people were claiming and it was in large part because of Eros when I went to the wind center with with Vic Eros had heard that I was a teacher and so he came up to me and he said you teach public speaking will you come back and teach us how to give speeches because we want to talk to the city council and I said well I'll come back tomorrow Vic said, we'll be back tomorrow. And what they told me was that the wind van had been stolen, had been recovered, but the Sacramento Police Department was going to charge wind the impound fee to get their van out of impound. And this was right after they moved from Midtown, which was centrally located for youth who don't have access mm -hmm. to transportation, and relocated them over to Oak Park. And now it seems as though uh, they're serving about one out of one-third of youth that they were serving when they were in Midtown. So I started to begin to unravel what was going on with youth, not just at Wind, but other places, and I found out that there weren't really any other places. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it sort of, be, it was just sort of this natural grassroots thing. We went back, we talked to the youth. Maybe it was coincidental, but most of them were identified as LGBTQ and started to be really revealing about their day-to-day -day experiences, about they walk 12 to 15 miles a day, that they can't afford to get on a bus to go get the free bag of groceries, and then they get a $150 ticket when they try to go to get the free bag of groceries that they have access to. And so this coordination of care, or continuum of care, just does not seem continuum, continuated at all. And I just saw a lot of gaps and a lot of holes, uh, and I'm kind of a person who likes to solve things and do yeah. something about it instead of complaining. And so we, as friends, kind of got together and said, hey, what do you want to do this summer? And we really committed to these guys early on that we were going to do an alternative media uh, platform. Well, I'm glad somebody cares, you know. Yeah. Um, now, Victor, what, brought but what brought you into this, um, just, you know, hanging out with the youth and trying to help them? Well, I think it's a, a couple of things. One, it was experiencing homelessness myself. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that I felt was really important was being able to go back and work with youth and help them provide a voice. Um, because one of the things that uh, Eros had mentioned, there's two really huge things that I think uh, folks in the homeless community face. 
The first one is the criminalization uh, for something that Absolutely. you cannot uh, uh, change yourself. And then the second thing is the mobility. Um, you know, a lot of what takes place is that these services are, are all over the city. Yeah. So a person who has very limited resources is expected to get from this place to this place to this place and still have to meet these type of commitments for time to be able to get there. And that's just not reasonable. Yeah. And look for a job while you're doing that. Yes, yes. There was one really good resources, and it was called Wills to Work. But because people don't know about it, or they wanted to like stop running Wills to Work, but I found that is a good resource because if somebody who's over by Lewis and Fishes needs to get over here by like, you know, the DMV off of Broadway. Mm -hmm. It's really not that far of a walk from the wind where it's at now. But like, they don't run on the weekends, and they only really work for like certain days and that they could like potentially go all the way to win and drop youth off there, that yeah. it would be helpful. And I understand you, you're out there trying to help other youths that are in the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, other, what are other situations with these other kids that you, you hear about? A lot of the other youth have more issues than I do because a lot of them are, you know, they're misguided and they didn't have like you know the parents I had I lived in a two-parent household they didn't have the guidance of their school they didn't have like people to teach them right from wrong so like they're like way out there just misguided like for instance like a lot of them become addicted to drugs they become pregnant or like they have issues just you know living day-to-day -day life become suicidal or they just become sick Oh, it's just, it's, it, I just can't believe how we're, we're taking care of our youth because you know what, when we get older, we're going to need you guys to be there for us. And, and I don't know why we're not investing more into these kids. It just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I know it's all about greed and everything, but, you know, I, I think of enough of us stand up and do something, you know, they can't, they can't ignore us forever. I definitely do, and I, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, one of the things that is so hard to think about, you know, uh, she's going to college, or he's going to college. Yeah. You know, can you imagine being a college student who, and, and this is not, this isn't something, this isn't something that's unique. A lot of college students are facing the fact of living outside of a car, or living inside of a car, mm -hmm. or living inside of a shelter, and still going to school at the same time. Um, and it's not just it's not just that age group. We have a lot of you know students who are in elementary school who are still facing homelessness. And you know it's really hard to focus on you know I'm going to go to school. Right. I'm going to get the best education that I can get. Yeah. When you're facing this huge you know obstacle of not having a place to rest at night, not knowing where your next meal is going to come from, you know, and and and, and yeah. yeah, and and yeah. being arrested or, or having the threat of being arrested for trying to find those resources. Yeah. And that's why this whole, you know, homeless issue, like, it's a crisis. And we got, they've got to quit, you know, ignoring the fact that this, California is one of the worst states for homelessness right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if uh, Steinberg is going to be helping the situation out. I hope he does. He has a lot of money if he wants to put it into that, you know. But I, some, you know, the barriers, though, I think are, are, are hard to overcome, even as for a new incoming mayor. What I found when I was looking at the bed availability is that in this town, at least, uh, not in Yuba City, not in Oakland, not in San Francisco, not in Austin, not in Denver, not in New York, but in this city, uh, we won't house youth unless they have a second mitigating factor, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a in our paradigm of thinking right now, it's not enough of a crisis for a young person to just be on the streets. They have to have a mental illness or, or addiction and try to go to detox or be in a domestic violent house or have a family. Families get served. Yeah. Uh, women with children get served. Uh, people in detox get served. And when you look at all of the resources, the people who don't get served are the individual men and the individual women and the individual youth that don't have a second criteria to get them in. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think there's, it's gonna be, get better. It, I, you know, just this, I think it was last year, the federal government put out a plan or a goal, at least to have us end transitional age youth homelessness by 2020. 
But as I look at all of the numbers and the paperwork, I don't see how we're doing that in four years. I really don't. I don't even know how we're going to house people. I mean, there's there's not six a, beds for there, transitional age not youth. Enough, and, there's not enough housing. Period. Right. And for the most vulnerable people that we have, there's there's nearly nothing. Yeah. I, I think you really know that when you looked at at California. You know, right now we're looking at 115,000 people who are un, unsheltered. Right, and I think uh, the idea of the solution uh, falls within the, the problem itself, which is homelessness. And that's one of the biggest, you know, uh, things that need to be focused on, which isn't, which is we need emergency shelters, which currently we don't have enough emergency shelters mm -hmm. to be able to have house the population that we have. We don't have the transitional housing and we don't have the permanent housing. And all of those things need to be put into place to move us kind of forward. And it is gonna take a lot of people being able to have that coordinated effort, not just in Sacramento, but across the state, yeah. to be able to say that this is a problem that, that, that needs to be fixed inside of our community. I mean, we all would benefit from it, all of us, you know. It's, it's, they don't look at the bigger picture, you know. They're looking at dollar signs. They're not looking at people's lives and, and how people are suffering or just, Life is so freaking hard, you I know? Think that's, I think that's one of the things that, that um, is interesting when we look at the cost. Um, you know, the cost of criminalizing homelessness is actually more expensive than actually providing housing. So a lot of what we see right now is the, the cost of having someone go to jail, the cost of having to write a ticket that you know someone can't pay for, like all of these different services that we're investing in currently, mm -hmm. if that money was actually focused and moved towards housing and a solution, it would not only be cheaper, but it would be better for the community overall. And it's overall. been proven. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't know what the, what the holdup is. Why aren't, you know, why isn't our city council, our, our you know, our counties looking into this and doing something? Because jailing people, it's like, it's ridiculous. It's a revolving door. It doesn't do anything. And they're never going to get any money out of it, obviously. They're going to hire more cops, I guess. You know, it's, it's completely backwards. Not to mention, like, housing uh, itself or having programs for people to go to is not the only thing that needs to be seen or happen. I mean, we have 40% of our homeless youth that are queer or trans. And not to mention, like, there are a lot of people who are also person of color or have a mental or physical dis disability. And those, those people are constantly unaccounted for and or just swept under the rug and, like, not served because of whatever, whatever problem or issue or wh for being them. Right. Like, a lot of shelters don't include trans people. A lot of shelters don't let people have service dogs. A lot of shelters don't help people who have addictions or if you seem like you're non-heteronormative. Yeah, and that's, you know, there's a lot of education that needs to be done. But I mean, I, we need to invest in programs that really get, help people be a good part of society and give back. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's something that I hope we can all start getting the word out there, opening people's eyes to this and like, is there any way for a person that just might be inspired to just help, you know, be it money, time, you know, do you know of any, anything that you can, you know, kind of point them to, to help? I think Eros is the one to answer that question for sure. Mm -hmm. If we were to get together and educate people on like homelessness in itself and we're able to organize places where people can go and they wouldn't be, you know, oh, let's have, you know, this over here that helps people, like the Department of Human Systems over here, but have a shelter in, like, Rosemont. Mm -hmm. Or have, you know, this shelter over here, but have this service that you need way over here. So you if need we, them to connect the dots. So yeah, they need have to have access, basically. They need to be accessible, and they need to be non-discriminate, and they need to actually help people get on the path to being housed instead of just, hey, you crash here, uh, yeah, we'll feed you, and you have to leave at this time, come back at this time. We, no, they need, should be, we need permanent solutions. They need to actually give people the option for case management. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I think one of the things that uh, has kind of motivated me to look at, at building some of those coordinated efforts is, is uh, just what you said. Where do you, where do we, where do you go to help? Uh, where do you go to be able to spend time? How do we get a coordinated effort? So one of the things that I'm working on this summer is, uh, is being able to coordinate, one, where all of those services are, and then two, projects that people can actually engage in to be able to help the issues inside of the community. Because I think there are people out there that do want to help. There are people out there that need to be educated. And, you know, instead of just complain about it, you know, help find a solution. Absolutely. You know, um, that's... People provide, they, the people are ready to provide. They're just, I think, I think it might be a national trend or it might be something that's more local, but the nonprofit culture in this town is a little smarmy. Yeah. And it's really hard to find the right nonprofits who actually do take the resources that they receive and redistribute them to their clients. And I've just seen a lot of real glossy nonprofits pop up in the last five to six years, obtaining a whole bunch of money without any track record. And I do think that there are individuals. Case in point, when I was complaining on Facebook about the young people that were getting their backpacks mm -hmm. taken, and within a matter of several days, we had friends and people that I'd never even met dropping backpacks off filled with things to give back to the youth. And those weren't people that were trying to have a PSA. They weren't trying to get anybody's you know, fame. They were really upset that young people were getting their backpacks taken. And then when they went to go retrieve them, the answer was, oh, you're homeless? We just throw homeless people's things away. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of, of, of uh, that's another barrier. I think mm -hmm. when you look at uh, a lot of the people who are just out to help, uh, the Community Dinner Project was a project that mm -hmm. started where, you know, it was illegal for people to be able to share food. Right. Um, and in a time where, you know, ha being able to get the resources together to help folks, um, I think that's one of the things that, that leadership and the council can actually do now. One is stop the criminalization of homelessness itself. And second of all, people who are looking to organize to help should be able to c collectively get together and try to help uh, people in need. That's what community is all about right. in the first place. Right. Um, and I think a, a lot of barriers have just put, been put into place to continue to maintain the same status that's happening and to criminalize folks who are experiencing homelessness itself. And what they don't realize is that our homeless population is growing. It's not Exponentially shrinking. Exponentially growing, in yeah. fact. And it, it's, unless they really get, get it together and really focus on it. And, and I mean, I would, I think the kids are the ones that deserve the help the most, to be honest, because, you know, they, they need some guidance. They need some help. Um, I mean, I know women and children and all that, are, they're in kind of the same boat, but the thing is, is like, these kids usually don't have anybody to go to. They have no family, few friends. Um, if their parents treated them the way the system treated them, it would be considered criminal neglect. Right. Amen. Right. And, you know, the social services can only do so much. It has to be a community effort, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then we have to get our our lawmakers on board, you know, to change things like now. <laughs> and and I, I think, again, that one of the things that it's, it's something that's continuing to grow. You know, one, uh, one out of every three people inside of Sacramento live in poverty. Um, you have one out of three people who are one paycheck away from experiencing homelessness <laughs> themselves. Yeah. And so when, when you look at the actual services that are provided, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's something that's important for everyone to realize when we're looking at one out of three people can face homelessness over the next year, and we're looking at people who, you know, counsel and all of the uh, projections say that this is, a, this is a number that's going to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 we have to look to our leaders to say, what are the solutions for a problem that you anticipate to grow year over year that you currently don't have the services to be able to provide and you know you you know for sure that more people are going to be experiencing the uh, experiencing homelessness it's an issue that that i mean it's a crisis it's yeah, a crisis it right is. now that is, is only going to continue to grow and, and our it's, mayor it's hard to understand that crisis though because there's so much public relations glossiness around the numbers that we get to get and so, you know, what you have to read between the lines to understand is that we house 70% of homeless, we don't house 
Wind Homeless Shelter, by their numbers alone, mm -hmm. they only house 20% of the youth that come through there. They mm -hmm. have an unsheltered population of 80%. That's huge. It's more than the general population. It's yeah. twice as more as the general yeah, population. It's crazy. So I think part of it is getting the real numbers out there and showing people what really is available compared to what looks like it's available because only some of the numbers are shown. And uh, so anyway, I think we're, we're collecting a lot of data right now, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we can work together to create in part by doing Access Sacramento and learning about media, you know, giving the youth a media platform to share their own voice instead of us representing yeah. them. And Eros, you know, we, we're almost out of time, but I just really wanted to get your take on how you feel about your future. My future is coming around because I'm in my junior year of college and I'm soon to be getting housed due to my parents coming back in my life and like deciding to like accept me for who I am instead of judging me and that's been a good experience. Well, I hope they come around because I, I know I can tell you have a lot of love to give and you know you're trying, you're, tr you're doing the best you can do. And that's, that's, nobody can ask for more than that. And, you know, be who you are. Be true to yourself. And, you know, hopefully that, that will be enough to get you through the hard times. And I, it's nice to see that you, you have optimism um, because <laughs> we all need that. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard sometimes. But um, so we're just about to the end of our show. Is there anything that you know you guys want to end this on? I, I, you know, I think we're in the middle of sort of trying to find places where we can develop collaborative processes. And so I would just really challenge the viewers to open their minds to let go of a lot of the stereotypes that they believe perpetuate homelessness when it's real simple. Jonathan Kozel said it. It's the lack of housing that's the cause of homelessness. Right. It's the ultimate cause of homelessness. Right. So that's what we have to solve, and we're not doing a good job of it, but that just means it can get better. I certainly hope so. I see some buildings going up around town, but I don't think any of us can afford to live in them, unfortunately. Yeah, there's not much affordable housing, and so we've got to change that. Well, let's hope we can all do better, and we have some impression on our, the powers that be and we help us, our kids out. We need to, we need to do that. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you guys. <laughs>